if you can think of a better title for this, let me know afterwards and I'll rename it. But yeah, we are not going to be talking. Oh, I did. We're not going to be talking about uh, how to meet friends and and influence people. Today, we're going to be talking about computer networking. So maybe it should be computer networking 101 for developers. I'm not sure. So um, this is meant to be interactive. Uh, I did it for the interns this summer and they asked a ton of good questions. So I'm going to hold you guys accountable to asking as many good questions or more than they did. So um, we'll see how it goes. So what I'm going to do for starters here is go through some terminology so we can all get on the same page um, to make sure everyone understands the words we're going to be using later. Um, so again, stop me if you have questions as we go through this. So one of the most important pieces of networking is the network interface card. Um, we call it a NIC. Uh, usually it's Ethernet. Um, Ethernet cards have a MAC address. Um, Wi-Fi cards are also NICs. They're just wireless. This is a wired version that you're seeing here. Um, IP address. So Internet Protocol V4 looks like this. Well, it's four octets, 192.168.1.1. V6 is big and ugly, so but it's the same concept. It's just a very large number so that we can have a lot more addresses. Um, typically, we use an IP address to get to a NIC. So it's a kind of way to, um, in, in, the, in the land of the internet, use routing and find an actual network interface card. Yeah? Uh, is there any difference between V4 and V6 other than the size? Like, do they still use the same way? No, there are a lot of differences. Okay. Yeah, yep. And so V6 is beyond the scope of this conversation, but I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one with you later, or we could even do a whole little 15, 20 minutes on V6 alone. So, yeah. And what, one of the reasons V6 has taken so long to ad adapt is that it's not just like some simple change to it, right? It's actually a whole lot more. So, um, so a port, a port is a specific network port. It's, it's, it's a number and it's a way that within an IP address, we can get you to a process. So common ports and processes are noted down here, FTP on 20 and 21, Telnet on 23, SMTP on 25, LDAP. So, uh, and just like with HTTP port 80, there's an HTTPS, which is 443, but there's also every port that is not a reserve port. I think I can't remember what the reserve ports go up to, but you can make your own. So a lot of people, when they're doing coding in Rails world, we use 3000. Java world uses 8080 a lot, but really it's an arbitrary port. You can make your server listening on any port you want, as long as it's not a reserve port. And if you have root access to the machine, you can actually listen on a reserve port that you're not supposed to be. So be careful if you decide to spin up something on, you know, 25, you might break your mail. So, so. Um, you know, only one process can listen on a given port at a given time. I guess there's an, as many addressable ports as, yeah, I guess, uh, there you go. So two to the, yeah, whatever it is. There you go. It probably depends on the machine to the OS and the version of the OS. Socket. So a socket is one endpoint of a two-way communication link between two programs running on a network. And so typically when we're building uh, software and connecting pieces of software, we have a socket client and a socket server, and we've established a connection on a port, and we're sending data back and forth using a protocol. So TCP IP, so Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, is a layered protocol, and it what it job is to provide virtual connections. So again, back when I said we're going to make a socket, we're going to connect from here to here, TCP IP is the protocol that allows us to say there is a virtual connection between two points. It's not a real connection. Um, it's a you know virtual connection. And so bad things can happen. But in general, it tries very hard to sort of make it look like there's a real, you know, you can imagine a wire between the two spots and you're just talking right over it. Um, it's, but because it's virtual, you, you'll see that like if you took down your wireless port on your Mac, you just say turn Wi-Fi off, your TCP IP connections are going to break, right? So um, it's not a physical connection. It's important to understand. UDP is another protocol often used, uh, mostly by in the DNS world, um, user datagram protocol. It's connectionless. So unlike TCP IP, it's which has a virtual connection, UDP has a new connection, and it's kind of 
smelt this. Let me send another one. Let me send another one. And we hope they come back. And so you can build apps on top of this like DNS has. You just have to be careful and understand that you can't, you're not guaranteed a response or, you know, you could be firing packets into the ether. URL. So uniform resource locator. Usually it's some combination of protocol, uh, HTTP for insecure, HTTPS for secure. You could actually have other protocols in your browser, FTP, et cetera. Um, the domain name, so www.yahoo.com would be the domain name. And then some sort of folder, but weather, I don't know what that says, Lahore, maybe a town, weather.html. So that's kind of a folder, a set of folders. You can have as many folders as you like. And then a port, and in this case, the port is assumed by the protocol. So you put colon 80 here and it would still work, but you don't have to because the browsers are smart and they assume all humans aren't smart enough to know what port to go to and that by putting HTTP, they automatically go there. In fact, most browsers today don't have to put HTTP at all. They assume you're going to probably HTTPS. Um, but those of you that used web browsers when they first came out in 1994 or five, uh, you actually had to type HTTP colon slash slash or it absolutely would not work. So a domain name, uh, solustreet.com is a domain name and it resolves to an IP address. And the main reason we have domain names is that they're easier to remember than an IP address, but also it gives us some flexibility and portable. So if I wanna move solustreet.com from one server to another, I'm gonna have to sometimes change the IP address and uh, if people out there in the world had the IP address written down, that would be bad because then they'd have to get a new IP address. They wouldn't be able to find us. But now they just have to remember solutionstreet.com and it will map us to an IP address. Protocol. So a protocol is a set of rules that govern, govern communications between computers on a network. Um, common protocols you guys will use in here a lot with TCP IP and that's, that's our connection oriented protocol. Um, and then a layer above that a protocol would be HTTP and HTTPS. So those are protocols we use a lot. Um, we don't have to use HTTP and HTTPS, right? Like I think a lot of people that are somewhat newer to software development, like think that's the only way to talk. And that's just because it's the most ubiqu ubiquitous and common way um, doesn't mean it's the only way. So connection in networking, a connection refers to pieces of related information that are transferred in network. So kind of talk about a virtual connection. It's how am I getting from here to here and setting up and tearing down that kind of communication gateway between the two points. Packet, oh, this is gonna work, good. So packet is a most basic unit that's transferred, it's gonna come back over the network um, when communicating. So if you think of it as once I have that connection set up, I'm sending packets, lots of packets. And packets are sort of decided by the network in terms of their size. They're decided by you in terms of what their content is. Um, sometimes as a programmer, you have a little bit of control over packet size, but most of the time it's sort of abstracted away. from you. Firewall, firewall is a program that decides whether traffic coming into a server or going out should be allowed. So here at Sleuth Street, we have a firewall um, and we try to keep out the bad stuff. Um, it can do a lot of different things from simple port blocking, like I won't allow communication over this port to actual packet inspection. So it could actually look into the packets and say, this is a web request and it's going to a place that they shouldn't be going to. So maybe we ought to restrict that or block that. Same thing with viruses and other things like that. LAN is a local area network. You can think of it as everything behind the firewall. That's the easiest way. And WAN, the wide area network, you can think of it as everything beyond the firewall. NAT. Uh, also called network address translation. NAT is uh, basically a way that we can take a bunch of IP addresses on a local network and only use one IP address to the public. And so this is very common. We do this at Solution Street. So everyone inside of here, if you check your IP address, has a unique IP address. They're in the 192.168 range, which is a reserved internal range. It's not a public range. It's not allowed to be used out there in the wild. It can only be used in a LAN, and what it does is when you hit our firewall or border router, it ends up sending us out all as the same one IP address. And so to the world, we all look the same from an IP address perspective. There is a way to 
figure out different, different things. But in the, in general, we all look at one. And the, there are a lot of reasons that this this is important. And the biggest single thing that it allowed was IPv4 to survive 20 years longer than we thought it would. So uh, when they initially built IPv4, they thought we were going to run out of IP addresses never. But then when the Internet took off and everybody had a phone and everybody had a device toaster on the Internet, they're like, wow, we're going to run out of IP addresses really, really quick. So uh, that's when they started working on IPv6, and IPv6 is taking so long to adopt. A lot of people were like, hey, we can just do NAT and save tons and tons of IP addresses. So before NAT was popular, um, it's okay. Before NAT was popular, uh, everybody in an org had to have a public IP address. So Arthur and I, back before they invented electricity, we had computers with IP addresses on the public network. And they were kind of like expensive and like you had to be special to have one. You had to like justify it as a business expense because it cost money and it was a very precious thing to the company. Um, and it also meant you were sort of like out there in the wild kind of like there was a firewall, but you were like people could go directly to your your personal machine. Now we sort of have this abstraction layer in between. So it saves a ton of IP addresses and it also provides that sort of extra layer of security. Does that make sense? Questions so far? So this is the summary. I put it all on one page for you. So if you want to print it out and stick it on your computer or something, just to have kind of a refer back of all the words that you know I went through today. So now that we have a basic vocabulary, get into a little bit of more fun stuff. So some of you that took a networking class in college may have studied the seven-layer OSI model. Anybody? One, two, three, couple. Okay. So um, this is sort of like a theoretical model of network layering. So starting on the most basic hardware levels, physical layer, working all the way up to what we call layer seven, which is the application layer. Most of us as developers work in layer seven. Um, quite often we get you know, uh, into trouble with our apps because of layers one through six. And uh, you know, the idea here is that each layer should abstract away to the next layer up and we shouldn't have to worry about it. But in the real world, leaky abstractions exist and they don't always work the way they're supposed to. And the difference between, in my opinion, a good developer or a developer and an architect is somebody that can just not just operate at layer seven, but they can operate all the way down to layer one, right? And so some of the hardest problems I've solved in my career have been chasing down these layers until I found the real culprit, getting it fixed and then having my app work again. Um, so uh, important uh, in, if you want to get from here to the, to the top, in my opinion, and understanding how all this stuff works. And in reality, there's never seven true layers. Maybe there's three, maybe there's five, you know, maybe, maybe a couple of these are put together, you know, with TCP, IP, three and four are almost always combined. Um, so, you know, this is a theoretical thing to understand the theory and it's good. But in, in real life, it's not necessarily exactly like this, I guess you'd say. Anybody have any questions at a high level on that? Okay. So TCP IP. So one of the things that's important to understand is when we're a developer and we want to set up a connection, uh, we're using TCP IP 99% of the time underneath the covers. Um, what TCP IP is doing to set up the connection is called a three-way handshake. So the client says, send a SIN, server sends back a SIN act saying, I got your SIN, and then the client sends an act back, okay? So three-way handshake, SIN, SIN act, SIN, now I have a connection, magic, right? So that's, that's how I can be sure I have a connection. Um, bad guys use this three-way handshake to do denial of service attacks all the time. Um, so one of the things they do is just kick SIN, 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 over and over again. What do you think that does to your computer? Right, because what your computer is like trying to set up connection after connection, each connection requires memory and processing. And so eventually you just got like thousands and thousands of these almost set up network connections and your computer goes just barfs, right? So same with your networking devices, firewalls, everything in between you and the bad guy is vulnerable to this. So what have we done? Well, we've come up with some sort of um, flooding detection on the network layer. So 
if we see some check you off, right? Or rate limit you. On the OS, um, Linux has something called TCP SYN cookies. And what it does is it sort of sends a cookie back on the SYN ACK and it waits for the cookie to come back via the ACK, not an HTTP cookie, but you can think of it that way. And it doesn't do anything until it gets the final ACK. So basically, it's like a very low op uh, defense mechanism by Linux if you turn it on. The downside is that when that final ACK comes back, it takes a little bit longer to set up the connection, but it's a good resilience that I do not know if Windows has anything uh, that does something similar, but I would assume it does. Okay, so to tear down a TCP connection, something similar, we do a FinAC on the client, we do an ACK and a FinAC on back from the server, and then a final ACK. So same, same idea, three-way handshake to tear down the connection, and now it's bilateral. So what happens if we don't tear down the connection? One side or the other sitting there ghosted, thinking it has a connection open, and timeouts should eventually happen, memory should get cleaned up. But again, this could be a big problem. So as a developer, one of the most important things is that you set up and tear down your connection properly so that your system maintains healthy, uh, health, health, good health and doesn't run out of memory, doesn't run out of process space. Um, and so one of the critical things in, in any programming language, you're gonna have a try, catch, or a finally block. Make sure that catch or finally block has connection close or connection clean. Sorry, Aaron, what's your question? Oh, yeah, I was just wondering, where's the... Um, I yeah. The yeah, I, like. I don't know the question. I don't know the answer to that question. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Synchronize, <laughs> synthesize. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Good question. We'll have to get back to you on that one. All right, so this is TCP IP. And again, this is... Again, all hidden from you as a developer for the most part, but it's good to know what's going on. So synchronization, synchronization, right? So um, we'll talk about scaling and processing and stuff. And this is it's, it goes kind of hand in hand in understanding when bad things happen, why they happen. All right. So web browser. So again, most of us are using HTTP and HTTPS protocols. Um, a web browser is using that protocol. Uh, so giving me an example, user types in www.sustreet.com slash blog. They could put a port in or they could put HTTPS or HTTP. The browser then goes out and resolves that domain name, turns it into an IP address. It initiates a connection to the server's IP address via a socket, right? And when that whole synac Act TCP IP process gets set up. Now I have a virtual connection between my web browser and that Sluice Street web server. Then the browser sends a protocol request via HTTP, which looks like get slash. So get me the root page. Um, and that request goes down through the local NIC, out through the network, through a whole bunch of hops, through you know your border router, out through a whole bunch of servers to the destination server. Server responds by sending back some HTTP protocol that says, here you go, here's an HTML file coming, sends that file back over the socket. So that's sort of the network that's going on. Do a quick demonstration. Does anybody know how to get the firebug thing bigger? Oh, good, that works. Cool. So what I'm going to do is up here, I'm typing in HTTPS to www. Can you guys see that? All right, sorry. I don't know. I know Jack, the URL bar up anymore. Um, but I'm sending in HTTPS, www.sushri.com. When I hit refresh, all that stuff I just talked about. Um, I'm opening up the inspector down here and I'm gonna look at the network tab and you'll see all these requests going on, but the very first one is the get slash that I talked about. So URL request method is get. Um, I'm sending over you know, slash to say to the web server, get me back the root. Um, and I'm adding in some HTTP headers that tell the server <laughs> kind of protocol related things. Hey, I want HTML, preferably. I'll, I don't mind if you gzip it over the wire. 
Um, and what that does is it lets the web server compress the results. So it'll actually send back to HTML as it's and, and inflate it, and then you'll be able to see it. That's important because usually networking, uh, the network is the slowest thing. So if I can squish down all my bytes into something small, send it over the wire, and then unsquish it, it's going to be a lot faster than if I send it over in exploded format. What locale, what language do I want? If I want a different language, maybe the browser can or the server can send back. Um, caching, there's a whole bunch of caching mechanisms, cookie. Um, so user agent says, what kind of browser am I? What kind of client am I? It may tell them I'm an iPhone so that the server can make intelligent decisions on what to send back. So then the response looks something like this. Um, this is the actually web page we send back, the payload. Um, but let me see the response parameters. Oops. Down here. Yeah, so these are actually response headers saying it's coming back as text to HTML. Yeah. And then the actual response payload is that HTML you're seeing down here. So this is what we're sending back over the wire. Now, as part of that, on a web page, the web page gets parsed by your browser, and then there's a whole bunch of additional resources that we have in our page, and that's what all these other gets are. But the important thing is that first get is triggered by your thing in the URL. All the other load items are triggered by the actual content of the page itself. Make sense? Anybody have any questions on that? Let's go back to our fun. So a lot of times we'll be on a project and we have a network connectivity issue. And so we have some sort of server that we're writing and we're trying to connect to some other server that may be inside in the local virtual, you know, in the local virtual area that we're in, or it could be in a you know foreign country, it could be another process outside of our network. And a lot of times it can't connect. And guess whose fault it is? It's always her fault or our <laughs> fault. Right? So yeah, you know, part of being a developer is that we're the sort of like the the ultimate uh, endpoint to the user. And so when we can't get our computer systems to talk over a network from one point to the other, there's a whole bunch of things involved that you saw, right? So there's the physical device, there's the operating system, the routing, there's all the network devices in between. Um, there's the software that is provided by whatever language we're programming in. Um, then there's our software, right? And so sometimes it's our software, but a lot of times it's somewhere in between, right? Somewhere in one of those seven layers, somewhere in one of the hops in our virtual connection. And so from my perspective, what we need to do is do kind of a step-by-step, -step, where did it go wrong, right? And the easiest way to do that is to go point to point. So let's say I have a situation where I'm gonna traverse three different devices and two networks, and I'm having some connectivity problem. So what I do is go for the smallest possible point to point. So first, can I get, like say I'm leaving my server, going outside of a firewall, going to another server. So let me get to some machine outside the firewall. Can I do that, right? So can I connect from here to here, right? The very basic point. Nope. Okay. Well, then I know the problem is between my machine and my firewall, right? And then I can look at that and, and try to debug it. If I can get out and I can get to machine one, then I know it's not there. So now I look between machine one and or machine two and machine three. Can I connect between those two on those ports? And if I can, then I can't, then I know that the connection issue is between those. So the methodology I use is find the, the, the whole path, find the smallest points in the path that we can ensure connectivity between and just work our way across until we find the culprit, right? Once we find the connectivity culprit, then we work our way down the stack, starting at our app. Is it a problem with our app? No. Is, if, if it's not a problem with our app, is it a problem with our language implementation? So if we're using Java, is it a problem with Java's socket layer? No. Okay, next, I'm on Linux. So is it a problem with Linux's TCP IP stack? No, okay, then is it a problem with the routing table at the OS? Is, is it routing out of my machine correctly? No, yeah, 
No. So then I go to my network device. Is it a problem with my NIC? Is it a problem with my network device? Is it set to half duplex instead of full duplex? So I'm getting half the speed, right? No. Okay. I'm in a device. And then I just kind of do the same thing there. And I just keep walking down layers until I find the problem. So to do the Joel methodology of network debugging, um, there's some tools that I use in my tool belt. So Netcat is a big one. Uh, trace route and ping are also helpful. So I'm just going to jump out of here and show you guys a couple examples. So what Netcat is, oops. So what Netcat is, is a very simple utility you can install on any Linux machine and I think most Microsoft machines. It's a basic, simple server and a simple client, and it does echo. So you can set it to listen on any port. So in this case, I'm going to set up Netcat and say, listen on port 4444. And then if I want to test connectivity just within my machine, can I get from my machine on one process to this process, right? I, I didn't mention that in my troubleshooting. Can I get it to it locally first, right? So then I say netcat localhost 44. And I say, hi, Jeff, can you see this? And if I get my echo across, then I know you got it. So my server can see that. Everybody's happy. So I know I can now connect locally from my machine on port 4444 to my same machine on 44. So I could do the same thing by going to a machine outside the firewall and have netcat listen here and connect from the client there. I can switch it around. I can have the server over there and the client here. So any port you want, um, if you're running on lower ports in Unix, you have to be root or sudo. Um, so another tool, so sometimes you don't have netcat and you can't install netcat. A lot of older machines will have telnet, so telnet, is generally what we used to use before we SSH'd, the insecure version of kind of remoting into a shell, but it also can work kind of like a Netcat client. So I can use Telnet to localhost 4044, and I can say, hi, Jeff, this is from Telnet, and it goes through. So same idea, just a different tool. So you can't use Telnet like as a server, really. That well, you could, but that would be a lot of work. But if all you had is a Telnet client, you can do it there. So Again, Netcat basic idea here is testing point to point connectivity on any port server from any client. Make sense? Okay. So another thing is ping. Um, so ping does, it just says, can I get to that machine, right? And so if you do ping, um, it'll basically send out these ICMP packets, which are sort of like internet management packets to say, can I get there? Can I get there? How long does it take? How long does it take? And so um, this is sometimes false negative. If you can't ping, doesn't mean you can't get there. Some network devices block ping traffic because it could be used for evil, but most are pretty friendly and let it go through. So uh, it's a good thing to try. It's like, can I get there? Okay. If I can't get there, then it could, what, what problem is it? I go back to my problem. But I, so again, I can do ping from point to point. It's a, simpler thing than doing the netcat stuff, but it's a good way just of testing, can I get there? Right? It's not saying, can I get the port 4444, just can I get to Yahoo? Whereas netcat will get me, can I get to Yahoo on port 4444? So a uh, simpler tool, but um, effective in some cases. Okay. The next one is traceroute. And traceroute is pretty cool. What it does is basically works the hops on the network to figure out, can I get from here to there? And how am I getting there? And so this can be important to figure out where the problem is in, in the network. Like what hop am I failing at? So if I'm traversing lots of vast machinery that I don't control, this might be able to tell me, um, again, problem with this is that a lot of network folks turn off the ability for this to do this. So sometimes you might not be able to trace route, but you can still get there. Um, so it can be a false negative like the other one, but most of the time it works pretty well. Um, so this is just gives you an idea to get to Yahoo from my local device. I'm going 10, 12 hops over the internet. So kind of neat, right? So you can kind of see I'm routing out through Verizon's network, several hops on their backbone, then I'm going to alternate. Then I finally get onto some Yahoo device. And again, it takes me through a whole bunch of hops to get there. So, but um, yeah. What are the 
that means that machine isn't letting you telling you what you want yeah and so uh it'll try to try to keep hopping through and sometimes it'll give up but yeah that's a case where those two hops were not letting you send icmp traffic um or they're not giving you thing exactly and so this can be really helpful if you're getting performance issues so like customers like gosh this is really slow right and so a lot of you guys are using aws and you know maybe you've set up network regions but maybe you misconfigured them and so people from china are going to the east coast and people from the east coast are going to china or what or vice versa and so doing a trace route or having your customer do a trace route and send it to you could be a quick explanation of something hey this is going on this is not right like why is this happening uh, not it's something you can immediately fix but you can send this to the right person and they should be able to tell you what's going on yeah you can trace out to any ip address i mean it's not going to be exciting like if i trace out to your ip it's going to be like don't you know <laughs> so don't be it's one hop but yeah i mean if you wanted to trace route to i don't know the verizon first hop there then it'd be two hops or whatever but yeah so yeah you can any any destination it doesn't have to be a domain name it could be an ip address too yep kind of implies that there's some way to know where uh, yeah it's a combination of all those things right like you kind of know where so the internet is made up of kind of backbone providers and certain providers operate in certain geographic areas so you can know if i'm going through this provider i'm probably in asia or in south america or africa or europe but uh, yeah, IP address um, geolocation is pretty good these days. I mean, Yahoo's certainly the best at it. Apple's really great, but there's tons of packages out there that will tell you pretty well. I'm, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys do it all the time, but like every time I'm in a hotel room, I pull up Google Maps on my computer and just see how good it is. And it's really darn good these days. It used to like be like when you're here, you're in New York, maybe if you're lucky. But nowadays, if you just hit Google Maps on your computer and hit where I'm, you know, you get a little with the button that says, pick me here. It almost always takes me to exactly the right address um, within, you know, wherever, whatever hotel I'm staying at. So uh, it's nothing built in, like IP addresses are assigned to companies and the company has to provide their location, but they don't have to provide the location of, let, let's say Verizon gave you an IP address for your phone. There's no obligation in the, in the IP who is protocol to provide your location. That's more just like reverse engineering over time and figuring out that you're connected to this Marriott network. And we know that this Marriott network, when it's connected through this network, is this Marriott hotel. Um, and it's unbelievable how good they've gotten in the last 10 years at precisely knowing where you are on IP. Um, if you have your phone, then obviously it can tell you with its GPS device exactly where you are. And I think they triangulate that. So they'll say, if this phone is here and it's connected to the same Wi-Fi network, then I can guess that that this guy on the Wi-Fi is also here, right? And so that, that's kind of how they can get really good at it really fast beyond you complaining like, hey, I'm really in, you know, the Marriott in Seattle. I'm not in San Francisco. So, any other questions? They have a dynamic IP with that network. A little bit, but again, most of those most ips that you route out as are static right um but yes that can be a problem those of you that have dynamic ips at home um you've probably noticed that sometimes you might get an ip that was used by a spammer and like you can't send mail out and you're like oh what's going on it's because some loser had it before you that hosed it up for you and now you can't send mail or you can't go wherever you want to go because it's been put on a blacklist and then you have to, it's a real pain to get off of that but uh, it happened to my parents one time and it took me forever to get their ip off the bad list and um or i just kind of kept every night shutting off their router to hope that the next morning they would get a new one you know the lease would expire or whatever so um but yeah dynamics can cause problem but most of the time when you're routing out you're like we have a static ip because most companies that 
have serious stuff have some sort of static ID. It's mostly the home users that could not necessarily know, but. King of IP is on mapping solutions.com. Yeah. Like I understand conceptually how a DNS works, but do you know any more details about that? Is it like some giant hash map somewhere? I, I give a another talk about the if you had a half hour, I can tell you exactly how it works precisely, but I can't tell you, but it's a hierarchical network of networks. So starting at the root zone, all the way down to the GTLD zone, which is ComNet, blah, 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 um, into kind of the um, hosted DNS, which you know GoDaddy would be a big one or any of the big hosting providers. And then um, that's kind of the resolution path. It's a multi-hop cached approach. That gives you the 30 second answer. Good, okay. Are you going to talk about what VPNs there are? Is that used to map out I don't think I have VPNs in my topic. That's a good hole. I'll have to add version 2.4 of this topic, adding in. But at a, at a high level, VPNs are a way to provide you know, virtual private networks. So they're not really private networks, but they're virtually private. So it's a way for me, if I'm outside of, an, of a LAN, let me go back to my picture. So if I'm outside of a LAN, can I pretend or sort of be treated as if I were inside of the land? So back into this picture, um, a lot of folks have a lot of stuff on their network here. Like we, ha we don't have a lot, but we have say one of our companies, we host some cached files that folks can get every day. And so if we wanted to, we could set up a VPN so that if you're remote, you could VPN into our network and pretend to be inside of this land over here on the left. Um, and that's, that's the gist of what it does. And the routing can get really complicated. And when you have bugs in, when you have your VPN on, that's because sometimes it's not sure, should I route this here or should I route it as if they're not inside the link, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Right now, we can, it seems like there's this pattern used to get around region bound content. That's a great point. So can I pretend to be coming from somewhere else, right? So if I want to watch English Premier games in England that are blacked out, I can route out to the US pretend to be a US IP address and then they'll let me through and I can stream it back to home, yeah. And the kids do it, my kids all do it. They're like, Dad, I don't know what a VPN is, but it lets me do stuff at school I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so like, one of my kids had this problem and I was like, do you have a VPN? He's like, yeah, I'm like, do you know what that is? He's like, no idea. But yeah, yeah, it lets the kids kind of pretend to not be at school or whatever, yeah. There are standard protocols uh, that are used within VPN. Uh, don't I, I can't remember off the top of my head the top two or three, but I think um, back in the day, Windows, most Windows used the same one, and I'm, I don't know the state of the art today. Yeah, yeah, it's very similar to that. If you think about SSH tunneling, so another way to sort of pretend to be somewhere you're not is SSH tunneling. And so what that does is it uses SSH protocol, secure um, protocol, and you tunnel traffic through it and then out as whatever protocol it was on the other side of the window. So we use this as Sleuth Street a lot. If we have a database on our server and we need to get and do some SQL, uh, but the SQL, to the 3306 or whatever port the database server is running on is not publicly accessible, will SSH in and and tunnel in and then make that protocol. And so nice database tools like DB Visualizer have like tunneling capability built into it. So it's like, you don't even know it's really happening once you set it up, you just hit connect. But what it's doing instead of connecting straight to 3306, it's connecting down through 22, and then out to 3306, and then back to 22, and then back into your magical browser. So. VPN works kind of very similar on a macro, like for your whole machine. So once I have that set up, I have that sort of secure tunnel that everything by default sort of routes through. Okay. So I think the thing to be careful if you have VPN on is that they're seeing all of your traffic most of the time, whether you like it or not. So there's no such thing as personal and non-personal at that point. So, um, although there are some kind of workarounds for that too. So, all right, so let's, how am I doing on time? All right, so let's get into some fun. So we talked about Notcat, talked about Tracery, talked about Ping. There's your help. Here's your tool sheets. Oh, I have config. Uh, I think it's IP config on Windows. I have config on Linux. We'll tell you your network devices. 
and tell you your IP addresses and MAC addresses. That's a nice tool to figure out what's going on. Trace route, ping, we talked about, talked about in spec. So there's your cheat sheet if you need to play with it later. All right, so let's talk about software a little bit because we are software developers. So um, in, in our quest to build scalable software servers, um, we need a way for our socket on the server to be able to handle more than one client, right? So if you think about it, I set up a, a, a client for socket on a web server, I wanna be able to handle 100 clients at once, right? And so the, the first way that we figured out to do this was by creating multiple processes. So each time somebody comes into port 80, my web server would fork a new process, hook up client number two with my process, let them do their thing. And so I just keep forking new processes for each socket connection, right? That works great for up to say 10 or 20. After a while, processes are expensive. They use a lot of memory, they use a lot of process. We came up with an alternative called threading model. So a threading model is like sort of a mini process within a process. It has a lot less overhead, it's a lot quicker to spin up, a lot less memory, and it can share data, right? So it's, well, I, processes can share data via IPC, but threads can share data much easier. You know, think about if you're in a Java VM, you can just set up a singleton, all the threads can have access to that same data. Like I could go pull down, you know, 10,000 records and stick it in an object and all my threads can have readily easily access to it. So I can save on memory, I can spin up, spin down faster, I can have a thread pool that can be reused and cleaned up each time I come in. And then I can use some combination of the two, right? So most uh, servers today are multi-core. So say a typical one use server, small rack mounted server is eight cores. And so in order for me to take advantage of all eight cores, most of the time I need eight processes, right? Because I can't really easily most of the time spread a process across the core. So in that case, I use a hybrid model, eight processes, and then with each process, maybe I have 20 threads or 50 threads. So that's sort of the scaling model. So that makes sense. It's kind of a lot to absorb, but it's kind of the high level. Um, if you need massive scale, so uh, massive scale beyond you know hundreds, maybe you're getting into thousands, um, there's an, another approach called async non-blocking IO. If you want to read all about it, this is a great website. It's been around for 20 years. This guy wrote this 20 years ago and said, I think we should be able to handle 10,000 connections on a commodity single computer. So one that you can go buy at Best Buy for a thousand bucks. I think we should be able to today handle 10,000 connections. And he challenged kind of all of us at the time to figure out ways to do this. And as a result of that kind of async non-blocking IO became popular and Kernel improvements to Linux were done, and programmatic improvements to C, C++, and Java. Now every language has it. Node has it. Um, so I'll give you a Node example of how this works. The way async non-blocking I.O. works is you have one server process that handles all connections. And instead of doing any work, it's just a giant table that says data in, data out. So it reads and writes data very quickly. And then it sends events out to worker processes. Um, so there are non-blocking worker processes and kind of typical mode is one per core. And uh, those of you that are programming in JavaScript with you know, promises, you understand callback hell, this is kind of the challenge of this model is because everything is async. So you have to kind of think that way. But the gist of this is that one single process can handle easily 10,000. I think it's up to the record now is like a million connections one single Linux process can handle. Because it's doing no real work, it's just literally writing to an event queue, writing data in and out, and then these worker processes are doing the work. Um, and sort of what this is really great for is if you have slow connections. Um, so a lot of people do, do they build a web server and they're like, I'm going to do some load testing and I'm going to assume every customer, you know, takes 30 seconds per page. They're going to read the page. They're going to fill out some forms. They're going to hit submit. You know, they're going to, and so they build some sort of profiling model, right? The problem is customers don't ever behave like we want them to, right? They just do whatever they want to do. And so what you can end up with is a lot of really slow customers. Somebody will open up a page to your single page app, click two or three things there, and then go away for 10 minutes to get a sandwich, you know, or come back later. Or maybe there's some bad, 
bot out there that's just hitting your site over and over again in some weird, obscure way. So this is really great at sort of handling that situation well because I'm just dispatching events as they come in. And so every connection is like a non-issue to me. I'm not doing any work. Whereas if I go back to this model, every time a connection comes in, I'm spinning up a process, I'm spinning up a thread, I'm allocating memory, and I'm like, let's rock and roll. And if they're not ready to rock and roll, I'm sitting there wasting all those resources, right? But this model, it's like, hey, we're always ready to rock and roll. Just send it and we'll deal with it when it comes in, right? So, and we'll understand the three models of scaling that we have out there today. Some combination of all three, um, depending on how you're doing it. So async non-block, popular ones, Node.js and JavaScript, Event Machine and Ruby, Java NIO will do uh, async non-blocking IO in Java, but typically Java is a multi-thread and multi-process hybrid model. Um, Passenger and Rails is a is a multi-thread and multi-process hybrid model most of the time, but you could there's add-ons that you can do to do it. I, I can't believe it. Unicorn or Thin is a is a more non-blocking. Uh, Nginx is a, actually Nginx is a is a hybrid model of all three, depending on the situation and how you set it. Make sense? Okay, so let's play with a little bit of code just so you can see. Um, am I out of time? I have five minutes? Okay, good. So, um, using Ruby, and I'm gonna show you the code first. So, oh, all right, so very simple echo server in Ruby. I require socket, which is Ruby's socket implementation we talked about. I say TCP server open. I say my IP address and my port that I want to listen on. And basically, I, I kind of sit there and I loop and I select on the socket. And so I'm like basically waiting for data to come in. Um, once I get a connection, this says I got a connection. Um, when the connection's closed, it says connection's closed. And in my loop, I'm basically just getting data off the socket. And every time I get some data, I'm going to print it out and then I'm going to write it back to the socket. So really simple, stupid, but a good way to show you how a server works. All right, let me show you my thread. So I'm connecting to that same server on the same port. And, um, oh, no, sorry, this is not my client. This is my client. So I'm setting the host and port. Um, I'm creating my new echo client on that host and ports. I'm letting me type stuff in. Uh, up here is a setup. Setup, I open the sockets. Tear down, I close my socket. It's bad code because I don't have a trap to make sure I close it, but I said before. I didn't write this code though, I just stole it. Um, okay, so real quick. So Ruby echo, that's my server. Oops. <coughs> Ruby Echo. Oops. Ah, you're the man. Thank you. That's the problem. I should have had a different port. Okay, I think I got it. Hmm. Hitting, it's hiding there somewhere. Let me see if I can find it really quick. That one's closed, that one's closed, that one's closed. All right, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna cheat. Change the port. Okay, hopefully this works. All right, so I got my server listening on 44 or 45 now, and I spin up my Echo client, and I say, hi, this is Joel. Got it, sends it back to me, everybody's happy, right? So what I did was to show kind of the scaling thing real quick, I'm gonna put in a sleep here. So every time after I receive, I'm gonna to go to sleep for 10 seconds, so now I'm going to set up the server. I'm going to set up two clients. 
clients here. So now I'm going to say, hi, this is client one. And now if I try to type here client one again, nothing because it can't process it, but client two is here, nothing, right? Single threaded server. So once it's done, it gets high, this is client, or it gets client two is here, and then high, this is client one. So it's sort of just queuing up at the OS level below, but my server can't kind of handle two at once, right? So if we look at slightly better code, not really great. Same idea here, but each time, I accept the connection. I'm spawning up a thread that I will serve. Go here. So echo thread. Same idea. Set up client one. Set up client two. So client two. So now I can say, hi, this is client one. Nothing. Hi, this is client two right away. So you see how I didn't have to wait. It just spawned up a separate thread. But client two, again, doesn't work because this thread is now sleeping 10 seconds. Does that make sense? So I went from a single process socket connection server and client to a multi-threaded. Now we can do a little better. So Ruby has a async package called event machine. And I can do that. So let me do this. And so if I go look at event machine over here, very simple event run to start server here. Um, and there's all sorts of things to where you can hook into this. And you know, it's not a really great example because it doesn't show much. But same idea here. I can open up echo client, echo client, echo client, task one, task two, task three. And I could open up 10 of these and it would just kind of deal with all of them at once, right? So just wanted to kind of give you a very quick, simple example of how you can write sockets yourself as a developer. This is Ruby, but almost every language has a socket implementation. Just Google socket implementation for Java or C Sharp or Python or whatever programming language you're in. And you should be able to get some echo server examples to kind of get you started about learning how to set up and connections. Any questions? Okay, that's all I have. Any, uh, any general questions before we end?